a non-profit organization in KDE, uh, in EV. Um, he gives us a talk about uh, K desktop environment version 4. Yeah. Okay. So hello everybody. First let me say um, I love this conference. I loved it last year and I'm even more addicted now. Um, my favorite one is the bouncy castle outside. <laughs> and for later the beer. So let's talk about your new desktop. First, that's me. Um, I'm, as he said, um, I'm on the board of directors of the KDE EV, and I'm generally known as the marketing dude within KDE. I've been developing software for KDE since 2004 and for various other projects before that. Um, in my other part of my working life, I'm doing research into software quality, and I'm promoting free software in schools. And there will be a talk on uh, Code Yard tomorrow at 11 o'clock. So make sure you, you are there if you're interested in educational stuff. So where's, where's KDE at right now? First, um, we, we weren't quite sure if this is the right way to go. What we did is we, we revamped basically everything. So it took us quite some time to, to pull everything apart and put the pieces together again. And um, in the beginning, we were quite afraid that this would cause the community to, to shrink quite a bit um, because we, we would not have a feature release for quite some time. In fact, it didn't. The KDE community right now is more healthy than ever. And that shows um, not only in the age, of course, but in the number of SVN accounts. That's developers that are actively contributing to KDE. Um, I've just five minutes ago updated this figure, and it went up from 1,634 to 1,653. And there was just one week um, between that. So we're probably gaining more than one extra developer a day, which is, I think, a good sign of health for a community. We're at roughly uh, 2,800 commits weekly. Um, in total, five million lines of code. That's very abstract, but um, for example, the Open Office project has, I think, between five and six million lines of code. And so we don't have all that much code. In fact, one of our goals is to um, make it possible for developers to write applications with zero lines of code. Might be a bit hard to reach, but we're, we're approaching that. Um, 65 languages and uh, a guesstimate of 15 to 25 million users. And that's an interpolation of uh, figures from various uh, sources where we're trying to find. It's not only uh, polls on websites, but uh, it's also just walking around at this kind of conferences and uh, uh, looking at who's running KDE, how many of those people uh, are actually running KDE. And um, well, the result of all this uh, gathering of uh, figures is that we are at a rough 60 uh, to 70% of all free software desktops. And that's great. This is the bit I wanted to get rid of first. And this is what, what's officially on uh, one of our websites that's called techbase.kd.org. Um, all information for uh, system integrators and people generally interested in techno uh, technological uh, issues should go to techbase.kde.org and check it out. Um, the schedule might change. Of course, we are a free software project. We are right now not doing uh, time-based releases, but we're doing feature-based releases. Obviously, we cannot release KDE4 be uh, before uh, some of the applications uh, just work. So, um, and another thing which is often quite unclear, all those dates are tagging dates. That's when we um, push the button on SVN, this will become a release. This is then tested and packaged, and roughly one week to 10 days later, it's turned into a real release. So um, don't start throwing stones or start bitching on October 24th, because then it's not released. It's only tagged. Um, OK, next. So what's KDE4 about? We try to focus on uh, three different areas, which we think uh, cover the whole experience of using a desktop um, pretty much. First, beauty, it's gotta look gorgeous. 
portability. It's got to run everywhere and function. It should do the job. Oxygen. I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of a couple of our uh, graphics artists, and that's the Oxygen team. First, they are crazy, so I can deal with them pretty well. Um, and they're making it beautiful. Um, highlights of Oxygen are um, vector graphics, so uh, we're trying to get rid of jagged edges. Um, they, they are really uh, checking out the desktop in a holistic view. They are trying to, to make everything uh, look consistent and beautiful. And I think that's one of the areas where KD had problems in the past, that it looked a bit, you know, um, icons weren't all in the same style, weren't complete. People copied icons from place one to place two only because they didn't, uh, didn't have the SVG sources for that. So we're trying to fix all that. But we're also um, putting oxygen on our websites. Um, you might have seen that roughly a year ago, we changed from pretty old-fashioned look to, um, to new website templates. Um, actually, the template for, uh, for this presentation uh, is done by the Oxygen team as well. And it's not only that, it's also mouse cursors and an audio theme. And you know, why should we do that? Because I like to use beautiful things. I'm staring at this thing for a couple of hours every day. And, it better be beautiful. But beauty is also about um, fun of use. That, that's where it all boils down to. So we have usability in mind when we are working on our applications. Um, it's, it's always been an issue that a lot of people uh, say, well, okay, you really got feature readers. They try to put in everything, and then it doesn't look consistent, and the user interfaces are becoming far too complex. And I think that is actually a social problem because it's, it's a scalability problem as well. Lots of people means that we need communication on how to solve common problems. So there's the HIG, which means Human Interface Guidelines, and that's um, a fairly extensive list of things and how to do things. For example, how to, um, how to put uh, things in a menu in which, uh, in which order should you uh, supply certain options, which options, options should be there, which shouldn't be there, how to name things, and all that kind of stuff. So um, you probably won't notice it at once, but if you compare various applications, they are becoming more consistent, and it's easier to spot the, settings you're, the setting you are looking for if it's named the same everywhere. Um, the whole uh, usability thing is driven by, the research, by, by a uh, working group. That's the um, HCI, Human Computer Interaction. I, I always get this one wrong, so um, don't beat me, please. Um, there's, a, there's a group of people specialized in uh, computer, human computer interaction, and they are uh, taking care of just that. Uh, those are people I can ask if, I, if I'm, as a developer, not sure how to implement a certain feature or how to solve a certain problem and uh, whether or not to provide uh, a checkbox for something. Again, the effect is not visually uh, visibly, visible uh, quite directly, but it, it becomes less annoying to use your computer. And like I said, I don't want to be annoyed for, uh, for the whole day. So we're, we're trying to solve that scalability problem of um, making applications usable. And at the same time, same time we try to not cut down on, uh, on features that, that people might love. I mean, I, I'm using this desktop because it's very, very powerful. I don't want to yeah, now have people going with an X through my favorite application. Um, a very good example for that is console. And if the whole thing actually uh, works right now, I can do a demo of that later and, and maybe show uh, console in the KD4 and the KD3 version, and then you will see that it's quite a different uh, difference. So Dolphin is um, it's one of the applications that really got one of those facelifts. We saw that um, Conqueror, our previous uh, file manager and web browser, had quite some usability issues because it, it did everything. 
um, Dolphin is very focused on the task of file management, which is probably for most of us quite uh, different from web browsing. So um, with Dolphin, we're optimizing an application for one single task. I think that's, that's very Unix C. And um, I'm using the KD3 version for quite some time, and it's, it's not horrible to not have you know, giant checklists and 10,000 buttons on my interface. And that thing actually works quite well, and it's, uh, it's very nice in KD4. So it's, um, it's optimized for file system usage, and it's got some pretty nice features. We got, um, on the right-hand side, those stars, and uh, I've put a note to that file. That is, files can be tagged. I can um, put meta information to files, which um, make it easy, makes it easier to, to find back my files or remember what was uh, that all about. I'll talk about that um, a bit later, maybe show some of those um, new things. Portability. Portability is two things. It's making sure our software runs on other systems, but also making sure other software runs on our system. Um, I do have some examples, so that's, that's quite abstract. Portability is really tech stuff, but I guess this is the right audience for that. So we moved over to Dbus. Um, Dbus is a free desktop standard. We're sharing that with, uh, with other desktops. So using Dbus, it's easier for um, applications to, to talk to each other. Basically, if I want to know something about the system, I can just ask um, on the Dbus bus and then get my information. And I don't have to care whether I'm running KDE or XFC or whatever. It will be, well, a standard. And we have a MIME type database. Um, most people probably aren't aware of that, but that wasn't there in the past. So um, what a lot of application developers did is they made up their own MIME types, which leads to a mess, obviously. Uh, same with icon naming. If I'm uh, developing an application and I wanted to blend in well with, uh, with the other software, like I'm writing a text editor, hey, I can do that, then I don't want to be a really strange um, save as icon only because I've written it in Qt and I want to run it in a GTK environment. So what we did is we gave those icon standard names. So now I can call from my application the save icon and I will, I will be sure it will be a Tango styled icon when I'm uh, running a GTK environment and it will be an oxygen icon when I'm uh, running KDE. Same with search metadata. It should be equally accessible for, uh, for whatever I'm trying to use it with. Um, then there's presence. Um, am I online or not? This kind of things. Uh, notifications, obviously the system says I'm, I've got problems, my battery is running out and I'm overheating at the same time. Um, and jobs, if I'm downloading a huge file, um, I will be able to, um, for example, I'm, I'm downloading a, a large file with, uh, with Mozilla and then I want to be able to know the progress of that from KD to be able to you know, um, show it in a, uh, in a certain widget or maybe just not suspend my machine while I'm downloading. So there's a lot about to say uh, of standardization and what we're trying to do is making KDE friendly to, to other applications. We're, we're not on an island. Um, I totally like this picture, although it's partly very, very wrong. Um, it's, it's still a good uh, picture to show what we are actually planning. Um, so yes, KDE4 applications will be able to run on Windows and Mac OS. I've already seen that. The workspace, however, so the whole desktop environment, probably won't. Well, someone can port it, but um, we are currently not making any effort to run a KDE desktop on OS X or Windows because they already have one and because, well, it's a free operating system if you want a free desktop. So that, that should be really easy. Um, our libraries currently already work on all those platforms. Um, we're on Solaris, we're sorting out a couple of dependencies. Uh, then we have backends. I will 
Um, come back to this topic of backends a bit later. Um, of course, applications which depend on, uh, on libraries, partly on backends, and the workspace that is basically the desktop as you know it. Um, so yeah, that's quite some construction plans and certain things uh, just won't be implemented. But this is very roughly how it looks like. Okay, function. Most exciting parts. Um, a lot of you people probably uh, has heard about the so-called pillars of KDE. And that's a con concept we introduced to make it um, easier to understand what we're actually doing with a desktop. Solid. Hardware support and hardware integration has always been a pain in the rear on the free desktop. And I just couldn't understand why things work in certain applications and they don't work in other applications. Um, so one of our guys, Kevin, stood up. I'm going to do Solid. And Solid is going to put that all together. Solid provides a unified API to um, basically everything I want to do with my hardware. It makes it easy to check out state of battery or get list of Bluetooth devices or check if I'm online or change networks. And that all via one interface. So as an application developer, I don't have to care anymore whether I'm running on Solaris, BSD, Linux, Windows, or, um, or Mac OS. I just use one API and the underlying system will sort it out itself. And that's where the backends come, uh, come into picture. So we, uh, for example, uh, for Solid, we have uh, a HAL Dbus backend, which uh, uses the, the uh, free desktop hardware abstraction layer to get certain informa uh, information and uh, do certain things with the hardware. It is, however, possible to just use a different backend. Um, imagine I'm on Windows, and I, there's obviously uh, no HAL available on Windows, then I can just write a Windows backend and use that, and I don't have to change or even recompile the applications. They will just be able to, uh, to use that. Obviously, um, it's future-proof and it's portable. Um, future-proof in the sense that, imagine the um, interface of uh, how it changes at once, then all of the applications uh, would need to be changed as well. And that's not, not possible if you um, want to provide some, some sort of binary compatibility throughout um, the whole release cycle. And so we need, um, we need a stable API to do that. Additions are possible in certain ways, but certainly not uh, renaming an important function. And we just do not have enough control over that to um, make sure that this will actually be the case. Um, this is how um, you, you don't see solid usually, but uh, you are able to see this. So what do we have here? Um, we have uh, different cases where we uh, can use different backends. And um, for power management, like checking out battery state or suspending the machine, um, we use, or on this machine, I'm using the health power management backend. Uh, network management is done through Network Manager. And um, Bluetooth management is, uh, is via the uh, Blue Z stack. Obviously, this is a Linux system. So this might look different on, uh, on other operating systems. I totally love this one. It's different languages. And you don't have to switch the language. You don't have to tell the computer, this is written in Farsi. This is written in German. And this is actually what Sonnet is about. Uh, Sonic re replaces the spell checking engine in, um, in KDE 3. And it, well, this is actually my, my favorite feature. Um, I'm communicating in uh, different languages. And I don't want to switch every, every email. So this knows in which language I'm, I'm, uh, I'm writing it. There's a short question. Um, I'm not quite sure, but 
uh, in general, we try to keep this stuff um, as free as possible of, uh, of unnecessary uh, dependencies. So huge chance that Sonnet does not depend on KD libs or, or maybe even Qt. Um, I'm not sure, how, however, but source code is, uh, is in our subversion repository. So um, I guess this will be available for other systems as well. Thread Weaver. Um, the last machine that has one single core in my home is my wireless router. My notebook has two cores, my workstation has two cores, and the applic applications don't use it unless I'm, I'm running various jobs at the same time. Um, Threadweaver makes your applications look fast. Not necessarily faster, but you can use uh, threading quite easily. Threadweaver is a very high-level uh, high uh, job-based API to you know, distribute computing um, over, uh, over multiple cores, test some sort of dependency tracking, and it's, it's a really easy to use API. Yeah, like I said, why faster and everything's gonna be multi-core? 3G, um, yeah, we do have search. Um, even more than that, so 3G is, is what you would expect from uh, from a search engine, it doesn't take too much memory, it's pretty fast. And um, Strigi also is free of, uh, of KD and QT um, dependencies, so you could easily uh, use that on, on other desktops as well. A couple of years ago, someone really smart with a cowboy hat, those two go together, yes, um, said that it's easier to find something on the internet than on his own computer. Crazy, but it is. Uh, so we need some some things which uh, which finds my data. More exciting, um, on top of Strigi, there is Nepomuk, and that's developed as a research project um, sponsored by the European Union. So you all pay for that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's um, the semantic desktop. Um, abstract and vague. I don't still completely understand what this is about, but my favorite. Um, use case is always that in the future I will know that um, a certain file has been sent by email to me and who sent me this file and I can get a list of all the things uh, this, uh, this girl has told me on IRC or, um, or sent me by email or no, whatever. We can um, make the mail client uh, tell Nipomak this has been sent by email from this person so we can build some sort of uh, social um, diagram. For me, it's much easier to find a file based on, hey, this was sent to me by, by Danny Mo, rather than when was it sent and in which directory did I save it? So that's quite cool stuff. And if you actually understand it, then please tell me. Uh, Plasma, that's um, the bling thing. It's, it's currently um, very much under construction and it's, it's growing at a tremendous pace and the code, code looks, looks uh, quite beautiful. Um, I've become a Plasma developer as well. So I know that it's very good. Um, <laughs> Plasma replaces the, um, the wallpaper, the uh, panel, basically the whole desktop workspace. And it replaces this uh, it with a, a container where we can store um, some sort of widgets on. Uh, those are called plasmoids. And for those, we have data engines. Um, let me tell you why. Um, in KDE3, we saw with Super Caramba lots of cool system information things, which all did the same thing. They chew up a lot of your processing power. We don't want that. So now we have um, a data engine, which provides data with an uh, event-based system. So, and, and I can put a plasmoid using that data engine. The data engine said, I've updated uh, of now the, um, the battery uh, percentage has changed, so please update the display. So I don't need to, to check every three seconds if something has changed, just get a signal and then can update the display. Uh, so we can keep um, a battery applet 
doing what it should do, showing the battery time and not reducing the lifetime of your battery to, uh, to a couple of minutes. Profiling uh, tools for this are right now available from Intel, so we can check how much um, battery your stuff actually eats. And Plasma is a, is a pretty cool step uh, towards that direction to not you know, make, the, make the desktop use more resources than it should. So we have some, some graphical uh, effects, a bit of uh, uh, completely thought through concept behind it. We're good at, at designing interfaces, I think I can say that, and replacing um, the thing that is kicker was a very good idea. Likewise with, uh, with Arts, our sound demon. I think people really, really partied when that went away. This is how some things of Plasma look like. Um, this is all themable. So this screenshot is moot. Um, I just wanted to, to show you. Um, we still have this dialog that you see when you press Alt F2. So you can easily run applications. There's a plugin-based system behind that that can also um, you know, use the file system index to find files. Pretty nice. And uh, this nice clock is one of the first. It's, it's actually the first applet. We um, got an interface for Super Caramba, the previous applet system. Uh, so we are, uh, we are able to use the widgets written for Super Caramba on Plasma. So we don't have to start from zero, zero with, uh, with those applets. And even, uh, you see that on, on the right, we are able to do uh, transformations on, uh, on those things as well. Think of this as a, um, as a nice animation, but we can also do alpha blending and, and all that kind of stuff. Hold on, I, I just named arts and that we didn't like it, so um, it went away. Somebody stepped up, said, okay, uh, we need a really easy to use multimedia API. That means application developers should be able to use multimedia content by only writing you know, like five lines of code. It's a good step towards that um, zero lines of code uh, goal. We won't make that within the four life cycle, but Vonon is quite nice. Um, it also has pluggable backends. I already explained that when I uh, talked about um, solid. So pluggable backends, we can use the Xine engine, we can use a GStreamer backend, we don't have to care uh, about API instabilities. Um, I can even change the backend um, on the fly. I don't need to restart uh, the whole desktop. I just say, okay, now please use the Xine engine because GStreamer doesn't have, have uh, this certain codec installed. And then Phonon will just uh, use that. Um, very nice is, that's for uh, voice IP and real-time communication, uh, cross uh, integrating integration of scripting in all our applications. Um, then we have Akonadi, a PIM storage, so all our emails are, can be stored in the same place. It's a, um, an engine that should be stable. I hate losing emails, it should be very fast. And um, Akonadi is also uh, not Qt nor, uh, nor KDE dependent, so it could be used in other applications as well. You can write your own email client without those um, storage details. KOffice 2, vast improvements there. Um, lots of cool new games. KDE Edu is, is going really, really wild. Um, and of course, we have KWIN compositing, so um, Yes, there are wobbly windows. Not on my machine anyway, because I'm running a proprietary ATI driver, which we all love. So one thing to say, um, we did pretty good with all the things we dreamed up and implemented, but KDE 4.0 is just 4.0. It's not like every developer is, is going on vacation after that. Um, we have a lot of, uh, of those new backends and we will only be able to, to leverage all of that within the whole life cycle. So basically now the tools are ready and we can start building. Um, we have lots of work to do. Um, okay, we'll do that later. So. 
This is what it currently looks like. I've started it uh, in a nested X server. Therefore, and thanks to my choice of um, video drivers, I don't have compositing available, so um, the compositing features of, of KWIN are actually, actually switched out. Uh, you see that it, this way it's still usable on, uh, on normal machines without uh, fancy graphics cards. So what do we have here? First console, then there's this applet. We have another applet. I can move them around on the desktop, of course. And then we have um, a very, very basic panel. This panel is only a proof of concept, and um, it's not what it, what it will look like uh, in the end. So Plasma basically is there. And there's a lot of new applets. Uh, this is actually quite cool. Um, those look like the same clocks. The nice thing is that they are only using the same data source and the same artwork. The, the clock with a frame around it is actually written in JavaScript or Ruby, one of those. But it's, it's possible to write those plasmoids in different languages. Uh, so right now we have, I think, at least JavaScript and Ruby. Um, Python will be there. And well, that's already quite some possibilities uh, for getting people involved. Why are we doing that? With the data engines, we're providing infrastructure. And with those plasmoids, we're, we're making it possible for people that are that are not proficient in C++ to extend the desktop. Actually, all of those things are plasmoids. Plasmoids is le mot du jour. So we have um, the panel, which is a container, and it has a clock plasmoid. And it uh, has a taskbar plasmoid, which is basically only there to switch windows. Um, a very nice thing about that is, in the future, if I move, for example, this battery into the panel, it will just change its appearance. It will be still the same plasmoid, but it will live in the panel. And therefore, it has um, certain, certain constraints on the size it can be uh, shown in. And so it might behave in a different way if it's actually placed in a panel than if it's placed on a desktop. So here's what happens if I place it, for example, in a horizontal panel. It becomes small, so it fits. So I can actually control within my code what this thing uh, is supposed to look like in, in, various, um, uh, in various environments. Uh, we do have horizontal and vertical panels right now. We do have the normal desktop. And we um, might want to you know, do some fancy stuff with media center integration. For example, you, you, you want bigger buttons if you're using um, a remote control to control your computer. And we are uh, also working towards integrating a uh, complete media center solution into KDE, probably within the KDE 4.1 timeframe. Um, applications. As I said, I really like Dolphin. Uh, this is how it currently looks like. Um, as I said, we have tagging. Sorry? Uh, when do you save these tags? Will they be saved into the file? No, uh, it will be saved in, a, um, in, a, in some sort of internal database. And it would be, uh, th there are certain use cases where it makes sense to, to store this uh, in the file itself. But the concept of, of tagging is not that a file gets a tag without a context. Um, the file always gets tagged within the context of of the whole computer, so it actually doesn't make sense to, to email the, the metadata with a file. Furthermore, uh, it wouldn't work for read-only files, and it, um, it, it, it very often does not make sense to, um, to you know, se send this metadata, and it's also got some privacy uh, issues. So central storage. Um, what I also can show is we have grouped views, and those are actually based on, uh, on the taggings. I can easily you know, assign another tag, and 
it should update all at once. It's, uh, it's still a bit slow, this whole um, meta tagging integration. But now you see I've got uh, various files with uh, different tags. Um, we have this neat breadcrumbs widget, so I can easily change the directories. Oh, this is a debug build, by the way. It's, um, therefore, it's fairly slow. So it's, uh, it's not at all optimized. So those breadcrumb widgets, if they work, make it possible to, um, to easily uh, switch directories. Uh, you can already see some of the Oxygen artwork here, mainly icons, but also the widget style and the uh, window decoration. Um, I promise to have a look at console. You saw that, that this menu was really small. I can also put the menu bar on top. Um, but generally, all those menus have, have been really cleaned up. There's no menu with 15 options anymore. So here, for example, we have previews, depending on which you roll over. <coughs> if you want to have a look at console in KDE 3, Where is it? So this is how those menus looked like earlier. And I checked there are no features that are missing right now. Uh, so console is really the proof of concept that it is easy to, um, to reduce user interfaces and to not dump them down. Um, we, don't, we don't want to, to make our applications stupid. We want to make them smart. Also, um, another thing that I really, really like is Ocular. Ocular is, um, is what was previously KPDF, and it's a document viewer for all kinds of formats. Um, for most documents that you want to view, you, know, you don't uh, need a very special application. You, you need one application that does, this, does it very well and that can show a lot of file formats. So for viewing PDF or um, you know, reading all kinds of, of um, strange documents, you can just use Ocular for that and be done. Um, this is not, not too special actually. We've, We've seen PDFs rendered on Linux desktops before. But we have some, some very cool features, such as, I think this is the shortcut, yeah. I can scribble in documents, at least sometimes. I can um, add notes to documents. So I find this very handy when someone sends me a document that I want to go through it and then I can just put the notes in there. And this does not only work for PDF. And the next question will probably be, where is that saved? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've talked to the developers and I said they, uh, they want to be able to put this kind of information into the documents because there it's usable or, or there it makes sense to be able to send this reviewed version of the document to someone else. So, Ocular, and then there is I wanted to show uh, something neat, now coming back to that. Um, imagine you're working, so you're of course listening to music, and then some voice IP call comes in. So you grab your, um, your Bluetooth headphone and put it on and then you should be able to turn down the volume of the music independently from the volume of what you're listening to. And most probably you don't want the music on your headphone but the voice IP uh, call. This makes it possible. So um, if in fact I had a Bluetooth headphone and it was connected to this machine, 
it would turn up in, in the right section. So there would be the digital and analog audio device, but there would also be the Bluetooth headphone. But why? So what I can do with Phonon is, and that looks like a good default setting to me, is I set the music to my uh, digital sound device and I put communication on the, in this case, non-existent Bluetooth headphone. And that's for all applications. This is not just for, for one single application, but this is the backend that is being used for that. So, what else did I want to show? Um, I don't know, what, what, what would you like to see? I'm very afraid of the answers right now. Well, I can do it like this, so actually we try to discourage people to make an icon mess uh, out of their desktops. What we, what we try to do is um, use it for something useful. Um, you can do that. I think it, it even works like this. So you, you get some sort of icon uh, representation on your desktop. And um, it, it's, it's still possible to just use your desktop as a file manager. Also, it's probably a waste of functionality. Um, one thing I really like, that's still a KD3 application, is uh, Yarkwake. That looks like this. Gamers among you know that, that you can, with one shortcut, put down a terminal. And the thing is that I use my terminal in a very different way than I use, for example, um, an image viewing application, just usual applications. I, sh I switch between applications, but I use the shell to, to do small things in between. So now think of Plasma as this sort of application. When I want to look up a word, that's a command line application I can use and just type it in. Um, likewise, in KD4, I can use, what is it? this dictionary uh, applet. Um, now it's not implemented yet, but uh, what we want to do is um, we want to be able to put the desktop in front of all the applications um, that are open so that I, um, that I can you know, disrupt my work very quickly to look up a word and then switch back. So just elevate the Plasma, um, uh, the Plasma workspace on top of it and then put it back very much like um, one would use the show desktop feature previously, but then it's limited to file management. I know it's, uh, it's on the radar. Um, next things that will be coming up in Plasma is uh, integrating Plasma with the window manager. There are certain things where the window manager has to know um, about Plasma. One very uh, good example for that is um, maximizing something. Now you see that, well, you probably don't see, but you might notice that uh, not everything is visible, so the window is maximized behind the panel. Um, Short answer is uh, very, very likely. Some more questions. Oh, um, you mean this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th this is very much work in progress. Uh, lots of uh, those things are proof of concept, and this sliding box will certainly go away. We already have, um, wow. Uh, plasma. Sorry, I cannot understand. Could you speak up?
Yeah. Yeah, as, as I showed, one way to uh, add plasmoids, very simple ones to the desktop, is just drag them out of the uh, file manager on top of the desktop, and they will appear there. Um, we also have this uh, um, applet browser, and will also be um, web enabled, so you can directly download um, plasmoids, usually scripts, not compiled code, uh, from the web and put them on your desktop. So that's very much what we already had in uh, KDE 3. That's the get hot new stuff thing. There was a question. I don't know. It's the f um, honestly, it's the first time I see it. I do have problems with my caps lock, but not with the X key, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely. You will get your cube. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, that's that's also a window uh, uh, window manager thing. If I actually knew the shortcut for the window manager, then I I could switch desktops. So yeah, absolutely. We don't want feature regressions uh, for a new version. Any more questions? Um, um, the answer obviously, obviously is partly. <laughs> um, for some applications, it simply does not make sense. Some things are new. Um, we try to to keep your settings as good as possible. Um, as to packaging, uh, we are sorting out with the distros lists of conflicting files, so um, we can actually install KDE 4 and KDE 3 applications uh, on the same machine. Um, we're not, you know, we, we do not expect everything to be ready with 4.0, so every application to be ported or nearly as stable as, as what we have right now. So. Um, it will be possible to run KDE 3 applications with probably only minor um, problems like um, DBus is new, old applications don't speak DBus. We have to think about that. But uh, yeah, generally the goal is to make it um, possible to keep your settings, provide upgrade scripts for that. We did that in the past and it's, it's not that hard. Um, and to make it easy that that all your applications, even all the applications, run on the desktop. Um, uh, not sure. Um, we don't. We don't think that we will lose really important functionality due to that, but. Um, it's, it's a very hard thing to, um, to port all decop uh, calls to Diva, so I don't know how, how this will look like, but um, Danimo might be able to tell us more about that. Uh, well, what, one idea that we had is porting the uh, essential um, decop interfaces, like say from KDesktop, uh, where you would go to and ask, okay, please disable the screensaver because I'm about to show a video uh, in full screen mode or something like that. Um, we're considering to build a bridge appli bridging application for that, but as uh, Silvash already pointed out, we're currently evaluating uh, what interfaces and what calls in those interfaces are really interesting beca uh, because it's of course a hassle to keep them updated and to keep them complete. Uh, so yeah, we have kept carefully evaluating that. Maybe we, sh we should cut off this discussion and move it to after the talk so um, we can have some more questions. See? I think that you coincidentally had uh, Martin Wittemeyer, uh, a master's or uh, a doctoral thesis on your yeah. um, desktop. So I wonder if um, the KDE project will uh, um, take the lesson out of this uh, very interesting uh, uh, work you did and uh, switch after the release of uh, KDE uh, 4 uh, to a more, well, periodical uh, yep. uh, release 
Yeah. Um, we didn't do this in the past. Well, we did. I used to catch. Um, KD 3. Point whatever was quite a stable platform. So um, we slipped our release schedule once by one week due to a showstopper bug. So we did have a stable, some sort of time-based release cycle, although it was feature-based. Um, Martin's uh, paper, which is quite extensively talking about um, how free software projects should, um, should release their software uh, and, tells and, um, and proves that it is the right way to do time-based releases. The catch for KDE 4 is that it's not possible in this case because it's a totally disruptive uh, release. So um, this is also uh, not really covered by, uh, by Martin Michelmeyer's uh, thesis. Thanks. Um, so will we switch to time-based releases? Of course, we don't know. Um, we now have uh, a team of people who are, um, who are working on release cycles and issues around that um, in place, but they're mainly sorting out wait, uh, details about how KD4 will be released. In my opinion, um, we could do that if KD4 turns out to be stable enough so that we basically um, could at any point say, okay, um, we'll make a snapshot in about a week, so please try to not you know, screw up our code base, and then we will release that, that as the next version. This is, this is actually quite likely because the really disruptive things are in place, and so yeah, it might be possible. Uh, we're, not, we're not talking about that yet because obviously let's first get KD4 out of the door, then think about time-based release cycles. Um, 4.1 will pretty, pretty closely follow up 4.0, so um, time frame for talking about that is probably um, spring next year. Danimo had something to add. <laughs> I'm also running out of time, so okay. let's see who's first. Um, are there any more questions? Please. Yeah. Um, we've actually had a Summer of Code student working on uh, Xenorama integration in, uh, in KWIN, and yeah, if, it's, if it doesn't work for you, then it's a bug, which we want to fix. I might add that. Um, so, yes. Any more questions? As soon as the door opens, please speak up. Second question, will there be binary packages not provided by us? We do sources. Um, third parties do binaries. Um, first question, um, most likely where someone cares about having a certain application to run on, on various uh, desktops. Um, there's a strong business case for, uh, for running Kmail uh, on Windows and Mac so you get uh, homogeneous or more homogeneous environments where, where you basically make some mixing up uh, operating systems. And then there are quite some people who want to run MROC on Windows. So um, yeah, as free software works, uh, whenever someone cares, it will happen. And it seems to be the case that there are enough people uh, interested in getting this to run. Um, last short question. So if you have a long question, then catch me later. OK? That's it. Um, well, thank you very much.
Werkstatt nur eine Frage, die ist jetzt ja. nicht unbedingt...